אוקיי. Hi to everyone, I'm Gishimon Biafu for Dharma Friends. Thank you so, so, so much for everything. So we can start. All right, thank you. So let's start with some breathing meditation. And then visualize in the space in front of you, a large open lotus, top of which is a sun disk and a moon disk. And on those three, your lama or your lamas appear in the aspect of Buddha Shakyamuni. embodying all enlightened qualities. With a body of golden light and wearing the saffron robes of a monk. He's seated in the full lotus posture with his right hand in the earth touching gesture and his left resting in his lap in the meditation gesture while holding a begging bowl. And then think that you're surrounded by all sentient beings. All of them afflicted directly or indirectly by a root misperception. especially those you don't like or who don't like you, right in the space in front of you, seated in front, not in the space, but seated in front of you. The ones you try to avoid or try to avoid you. And I think that sentient beings all appearing as humans. Are play, placing their hope in you. To help them overcome their suffering. And so generate a sincere feeling of 
warmth, closeness, and concern in the form of affectionate love for each and every sentient being, including those right in front of you. And that affectionate love then gives way to great compassion, aspiring for each and every one of those sentient beings around us to be free from all unwanted experiences and the causes of those experiences, as well as the heartfelt aspiration, may I be able to lead them to a state free from any unwanted experience and its causes. And then allow this mind, this mental factor of great compassion, all sentient beings to grow even stronger. To give way to the altruistic attitude that is determined to do all we can to help sentient beings reach a state free from any type of suffering, a state of lasting happiness. And then based on the understanding that we're able to do so only once we attain the enlightened, the enlightened state of a Buddha, generate the mind of enlightenment, the sincere aspiration to become fully enlightened for the welfare of each and every sentient being, including those in front of us. And think that it's also with that motivation that we continue to study the fundamental wisdom. And then in order to deepen our refuge and our bodhicitta, let's recite the prayers. Mindfully, I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity, and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. 
by the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity, and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, practicing generosity, and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. Okay. Then we'll start with our Lamrim. Okay. The next topic after taking refuge is developing conviction in actions and their effects, in karmic actions and their karmic results. And I, I want to ask you for this coming week to make that your main limb room topic. So to consider the idea or the concept of any kind of result arising from a cause. So anything that is changing, including all our experiences, have causes. Now, we're actually quite good with the law of cause and effect, the law of cause and effect in general. I'm not talking about the law of karma, which is a, a part of the law of cause and effect. It's included in the law of cause and effect because, of course, not every cause is a karmic cause. Not every result is a karmic result. However, although we're quite good with the law of cause and effect, we know if we eat certain foods, if we, I don't know, exercise or um, stay away from, I don't know, certain foods, that this will have a certain result. We know when we study for an exam or why we study for an exam, because there'll be an, a result. I mean, all day long, we're surrounded by causes and its effects, and we act accordingly except when it comes to karma. I mean, at times, if we are convinced of the law of cause and effect, but again, conviction happens on, a, on different levels. There's an intellectual conviction, and there's a much deeper conviction, a deeper sense that all my actions will have consequences. To really feel this from deep within, and of course, <clears throat> based on feeling, and we have that naturally, the wish to be free from suffering, and understanding that, of course, there are other factors, external factors that are, uh, if you like, cooperative conditions. There are certain, there, there are surface conditions for suffering, but the main cause really are the causes, are the karmic causes we've accumulated in the past. And so with the law of cause and effect, well, first of all, we're pretty inconsistent, many of us. In some cases, we just go ahead and, and act in a certain way, having the sense, oh, it'll be all right. It's not going to be a problem. There won't be any consequences to my actions. So in that sense, we're, we're inconsistent when it comes to the law of cause and effect, including, in this case, the law of karma. But even if, as I said earlier, we are convinced on an intellectual level, well, that's not enough. It needs to be part of our emotions as well to have a deep-seated sense, whenever something happens to me, it's not just the people who, well, seem obviously to be those who cause the problems, but that without them, without, well, without them, if I'd accumulated the cause, or no, I should put it differently, if I hadn't accumulated the karmic cause for that situation to arise, it would have never happened. And it's not so much about blaming myself, because as we heard over the last few weeks, I am the person I am right now is not the person who accumulated the karmic causes. It's, just, it's the same continuum, but it's not the same person. So if I were to blame myself, that would be an example of perceiving myself and the person of the past to be one. And that, as we know, is a mind that perceives permanence incorrectly perceives 
one's own self to be permanent. No, to know I'm not that same person. What I've done in the past, I wouldn't do now. And still I I I I experience the results from the past. It's like it's like pollution. The stuff we would put in the rivers, what we, we did or people put in the rivers, I don't know, 30 years ago, we wouldn't put in right now, but we still suffer the consequences of whatever pollutant uh, was le left was left in the rivers and the in the in the streams and so forth. So similarly here, whatever we've done in the past, well, we may not do right now, but still we suffer the consequences. And that is actually liberating in the sense that, for instance, oftentimes uh, people who've suffered abuse, they don't like to be called victims, but survivors. For the simple reason that it's so pessimistic to say I'm a, I'm a victim, like it's just something happened to me and there was nothing, there's nothing I can do. Instead, I can do something. I'm a survivor. So similarly, with karma, it's not like I'm a victim, but rather I can do something. Because yes, I was part, I accumulated causes and conditions, the causes and conditions for that to happen, what happens to me. And of course, other people were also involved. Of course, we spoke about it before, but I was also part of it. And that is so liberating because I I've done something. I've 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 contributed to the situation. So if I contributed contributed to the situation, then I can also change something now and I can make sure that it doesn't happen again. I can now control, I can learn to control my reaction to any kind of experience. And instead of, for instance, getting angry and, and resentful and retaliating and stuff, well, I may choose to be patient and deal with the situation in such a way that it doesn't happen to me again, that I don't experience this again. So this is so crucial to integrate that into our daily life. Whatever happens, to have it in the back of your mind. Oh, karma. Oh, something happens. Oh, gosh, mm, wish it didn't. But okay, I accumulated the causes for that. All right, that's okay. Okay, I can learn from my past mistakes now in the form of experiencing the result of it. Well, let's make sure I don't act in the same way again. I personally find that liberating. So. It's not like things are just done to us. No, things happen to us because we accumulated the causes and conditions for those. And we can continue to accumulate causes and conditions for the future to, to kind of uh, create our own future. It's like karmic Amazon, the stuff you want instead of ordering online. Well, you act accordingly and then sooner or later, you'll get the result, maybe a little later, but Never mind. It may take longer. If you order something online, it may take weeks and months. So it may take a few lifetimes, but eventually it'll come back. Okay. So to remember that for this coming week, just focus on that. Any kind of action, anything that comes to mind, not action, sorry, any kind of result you've experienced, especially those painful ones, the, the emotionally charged kind of, just remember, okay. I accumulated the causes and conditions for that. Yes, there were other people involved. I'm not saying that we don't need cooperative conditions or certain conditions that also assist the ripening of this karma. But it's always you always need two. It's like you need two to tango. So here it's like you need two. You need other conditions for the karma to ripen, but you also need the karma that was accumulated by your former continuum. So. Before we really dive into some of the aspects, I would like you to focus on that for the coming week. Okay. Then the last song. Oh, and I forget. In the previous class, when we went through um, Chandrakirti's entry into the Middle Way, I emphasized love and compassion much more, especially bodhicitta. I emphasized that much more. So I've neglected it, and I want to go back to that. So while you do the Lamrim practice, of course, two, there's two aspects. The two tone is always stresses. So emptiness, of course, that's what we are learning mainly here based on Nagarjuna's text, but also compassion, 
great work, great compassion, and in particular, bodhicitta, to not let, not let go of that and somehow bring it into your practice. So, for instance, reflect on karma, reflect on causes and conditions, and then when you've done that for a while, also, of course, remember that's only conventionally the case, cause giving rise to an effect. And as we continue with the first chapter, it becomes even more obvious how causes and effects lack inherent existence. But still, whatever you know about emptiness, to bring that into your meditation. And of course, remember, it's for the benefit of all sentient beings. I've made that commitment for the benefit of sentient beings. So to adjust my actions, to understand the law of cause and effect better on a deeper level, not just for my own benefit, but for the benefit of all sentient beings. And however fake it may feel, it's like fake it until you make it, right? I mean, it seriously it works. It's like you leave new imprints in the mind, kind of behavioral patterns, which are kind of thought patterns, which even if it's fake, the more you do it, the, 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 the more you get used to it and it comes slowly, it comes more and more natural. It's like our body, our, our mind functions very similar in that respect as our body in that certain movements initially, like if you do yoga or whatever other uh, kind of discipline, initially it's, 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 it's unnatural. It doesn't feel natural at all. But you keep doing it, you keep doing it until your body gets used to it. Muscle memory assists you in that it becomes pretty natural. So in that sense, our mind works the same way. Okay. All right. But then next, the next uh, part of this lesson is now is the other question. Well, it's actually the, the text itself, going back to emptiness, but I received some questions. So I want to go through some of the questions. I don't know when I can finish all of them, quite a few. So I'll do it. There are th actually three three questions, Jimmy's and then Eduardo. Though Eduardo, I don't know. It's, it's more of a comment, yeah, train of thought. It's more, it's not a question. But I'll try and go through one of each and then finish the rest. Okay, so B's question. B's there. I saw a little B. So I want to make sure I can see B. Let me just I'm gonna do this. Where's B? She there's she. okay, B. All right. So your question is: is there a difference between saying arise inherently from self, others, etc., versus arise from self or others? Okay, inherently. So it's the first part of the question. Do you need to add, as part of this refutation, I mean, really what we're refuting is arising from self, arising from others, and so forth. So do you need to add the word inherently? Important question. Do you need to add the word inherently? Now, first of all, B, would you agree that if something arises on a conventional level, it either arises from something that is one with itself or different from itself. Would you agree? Okay. No, man. Okay. Anyone else? I'm choosing someone else I'm, there. Oh, B, are you there? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. So would well, you agree? I'm, yeah, go ahead. Or if we just say conventionally. Yeah. Just I, then it won't be in, it won't be inherently arising. No, no, inherently is out of the picture. Uh, out inherently is out. But if I ask you, if something arises from a cause, is that cause either one with that result or different from it? What do you think? Different from it. Different, totally, absolutely. So nothing, no result can arise from something that is itself, right? Not as an exact self. Exactly, not exactly itself. So since that's the case, we don't need inherently. We don't need inherently 
because it's it doesn't exist to arise from itself it doesn't even exist so we just need to refute that we don't need to we don't need to bother about inherently for instance i'm not an elephant okay so negating that i'm an elephant i don't have to negate that i'm inherently not an elephant i mean it's why would i do that i'm not an elephant i just need to refute that i'm not an elephant that's it but in this case we are also mm -hmm. refuting arising from other yes so the word inherently leads to needs to only be applied to others arising from self you don't need to say arising from inherently self you don't need to say but you need to say arising from inherently others or inherent something that is inherently different because we are not negating conventional difference only inherent difference does that make sense uh, so, yes, it makes sense to me, but in uh, Nagarjuna's original text, since yeah. he didn't have this word inherent, yeah. so it's up to us to add it or not add it. Exactly. You see, these verses are written or are composed, yeah, written with a certain meter. And so it wasn't always necessary. It was implied. It, everyone knew being different refers to inherently different. So we apply reasoning. Okay, and in the commentaries, of course, explain it as well, that although it's not mentioned in the root text, it just says arising from other or for something different, what it means is inherently. Okay, so that is an answer to your first question. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Thank first you. part of your question. Now, is the point of this diamond sliver reasoning to negate the four ways of arising or the four ways of inherent arising? Okay, so I've already mentioned, I mean, I've already answered that, right? So the point of this diamond sliver reasoning to negate the four ways of rising, only being different, the only of those four that is actually on a conventional level possible, only that is inherently negated. I mean, even only there do you need to add the word inherently. So in other words, when you formulate the reasoning, Nothing arises inherently because it doesn't arise from itself. It doesn't arise from something inherently different. It doesn't arise from both. Okay, so in a way you could say here yeah, you have to also mention inherently different and from itself. And it doesn't arise from costlessly. It doesn't arise from neither. That is, it doesn't arise without a cause. So in that sense, there are only some of these four, four extreme ways of arising that require the word inherently to be to be added. Okay, so I hope that's clear. Now, in terms of the last part of the question, in terms of the reasoning of dependent arising, which of these four arising would it be? Okay, now I'm gonna ask you, which of these four, does dependent arising exist? Yes, right? Depending arising exist. So which of these four arisings would it be? Are you talking about the four extreme ways of arising? I mean, arising from itself, from something inherently different, from something that's both, or causelessly arising. Are you talking about the four arisings in that way or the opposite of that? Well, I would think that it's depending uh, arising from others. Okay, but the four arisings, when you say the four arisings, are you talking about the four arisings that are to be negated? You see, that's, that's my confusion. Yeah. That when Nagarjuna's original text just lists the four arising, yes. and, and then the four arising are typically negated. I mean, we always negate all the four. Yes. Then it seems that it negates only the it negate also, also the conventional uh, arising from others. Okay, no, he doesn't. Yeah, no, he doesn't. He doesn't. Yeah, yeah absolutely so. not. So therefore, dependent arising is none of these four extreme ways. But has it arisen? Absolutely. How the, has it arisen? Well, it has arisen from a conventionally different cause, just not from a absolute different cause, just not from an inherently arisen cause. Does that make sense? 
Yes, yes. Okay, I just wanted, I just needed to confirm that. Thank you so much. Yes, you're welcome. No problem. Okay, then Jimmy's first question. Before each class, we are asked to visualize the image of Buddha Shakyamuni. I wonder what is the existential status of a visual visualization? Is it a conceptual mental image? Number, Nawa, same meaning again. Well, okay. Here, with regard to a conceptual mind, it's, well, the visualization. We visualize with the conceptual mind. Sense consciousnesses don't visualize. Now, if you visualize Buddha Shakyamuni, Buddha Shakyamuni in the space in front of you, well, you may choose an image first, an actual image, and look at that with your eye consciousness, um, perceive it with your eye consciousness, and then based on the memory, remembering, I mean, then you don't look at the image while you're meditating. You close your eyes or you, you gaze in the space in front of you without looking at the image. So then it's from memory, you rec recalling the image and you're probably adjusting it a little bit. I mean, because you don't have an actual Buddha in front of you, but you visualize an actual Buddha, like three-dimensional and so forth. So your conceptual mind now, what does it perceive a uh, Buddha? made of light, golden light, wearing the suffering robes, the way we did it just before class. That is a impermanent phenomenon. It's an impermanent phenomenon. So that impermanent phenomenon, although you visualized it, right? This, this visualization, I mean, well, does it exist or not? Well, that's the second question. Okay, it's a it's an impermanent image. Let's put it that way. It's an impermanent phenomenon. Let's put call it a phenomenon. So that impermanent phenomenon is not the mental image because the mental image, mental image number actually it's not really number. It's nawa. It's that it's the appearance itself to that mind that is permanent it's just the negation of anything that is not that buddha's body okay it's the it's the negation of anything that is not so it's just it's just that general sense we have of a buddha's body and it's mixed with the buddha's body it's too too it would take too long i mean it, to, to explain about conceptual consciousness the mental image and so forth the, the generic image as it's called but this generic image it's important that that is impermanent that it is permanent and it just refers to the the it's this this abstract this permanent image called an image so it's a permanent image that is really just the negation of everything that is not the Buddha, right? So we visualize the Buddha. The Buddha is the actual, this, this phenomenon, this is the actual Buddha, but the mental image is merely the generic idea we have of the Buddha, and it's just the mere negation of, of the opposite of the Buddha. Okay, I hope this is a little clearer. It, it, it's really difficult to explain it. For those of you who studied Lorik, you, you probably have a better sense of what is meant with that. So what appears to you or what appears to your mind at that moment is both the permanent image as well as the Buddha. So they appear as mixed, which is why it's so difficult for us to tell them apart. Maybe the Buddha image is not <clears throat> the best example. If you think of, let's say you think of your car, if you have a car, let's say it's a red car and you visualize that, or you think of your mother, your mother is not in the room right now. So you're thinking of your mother. <clears throat> there is an image of your mother appearing, a permanent image, which is just the opposite of not your mother. And it's usually the way we understand that it's kind of, it's it's just a, the opposite of not your mother. It's just this permanent image. The way we, we can generate a sense for that is that it seems almost like she's frozen in time. It's just this, almost like a snapshot of her. And even if it comes together with a certain movement, but it's not the full image itself. It's not the full person itself. It's really just a general sense of 
I don't know, maybe your last memory of your mother or whatever, that appears in the form of that permanent image. But it's mixed with your actual mother. So those two are mixed. Okay, I don't know how else to explain it. Because they're mixed, it's so difficult to identify it. It's very difficult for us to identify. We know there's something appearing, but it's very hard to know what is the permanent part and what is the impermanent part because it appears mixed. And so he then asks, is this image appearing without a corresponding external object? Well, the question is, well, does it appear without a corresponding external object? How about your mother? Is there a corresponding external object? Yes, your mother. So thinking of your mother. What about the Buddha's image? Well, the Buddha. So there's a corresponding external object, the Buddha. And how do we apply the four criteria of production to this image? Well, um, does this image, I mean, you, you allow the Buddha to appear to your mind. Whether the Buddha exactly looks that way, that's different. But I mean, that is true for about anything. If you visualize a tree, when you think of a tree, for instance, right? You think of the tree in your, in your, in your, I don't know, in your garden. So the way you visualize it, does it exist out there? Probably not. I mean, there's a, it's a resemblance. It's the way we remember it, but it's never as clear with all its details and you know the exact shapes of, of its branches, etc. That never appears. So the conceptual mind never exactly gets at its object, right? It's always just a rough representation of what's there. Um, so therefore, you could argue, does it exist exactly like that out there? Not exactly like that, but there's a corresponding external object. In the case of the tree, it's the tree. In the case of your mother, it's your mother. I mean, thinking of your mother or visualizing the Buddha. Well, it's the actual Buddha, though it's more likely that the 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 way you take to mind your mother and the tree, it comes closer to the actual tree than to the Buddha, because, of course, we've never seen, well, we may have seen the Buddha, but we don't remember. I mean, this person in this life hasn't seen, unless you have got some some pure vision or something. Uh, we don't exactly know what the Buddha looked like. So it's only through description in the scriptures that we have some sense. Okay, but it's similar. I guess. Okay. And how do we apply the four criteria of production to this image? Well, I've already answered that by answering B's question. It's none of those four. The Buddha who we visualize, the, the impermanent Buddha, who appears mixed with the generic image or the permanent image, meaning generality, whatever you want to call it. So that impermanent Buddha doesn't arise from itself, does not arise from inherently other, doesn't arise from any of the four, instead arises, has arisen, I should say, has arisen from a conventionally different cause. Okay. Um, I want to go through the last, the other questions, because he's asking about the initiation. Um, Okay, so because the upcoming initiation, which, oh, or the empowerment, which reminds me, we can't have class next week because of the upcoming empowerment by His Holiness. Um, on Tuesday morning is the first day of the teachings, and I'll have to go to bed really early, and I probably have to prepare a lot for the next day to, to be able to translate. So no class next Monday. But... Um, only next class I'll have to um, cancel, but then the week after, of course, we'll continue. So, we usually instructed to use the mind that focuses on empty to appear. No, everything dissolves into emptiness. We reflect on emptiness. So, dissolves, not literally saying that you're sucked into emptiness, but you bring to mind emptiness. And from with, within that state of in, in a sense, it's like here you're almost, almost not just almost, it's like nothing is there. The sense of nothingness, but of course it should be emptiness and not nothingness. From within that state, you appear, you rise in the form of a Buddha figure. figure. So how do we actually do that? Well, you reflect on 
everything dissolving into emptiness, you take to mind the lack of inherent existence of all phenomena. So letting go of ourselves, I look like this, I'm like that, I'm limited, I'm 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 this this person, that person, and you allow your mind to look at yourself to rise in the form of a of a Buddha figure. And so with these pure qualities, okay, just again to train the mind, to train the mind, to familiarize the mind uh, with the idea or, or to, to let go of our limited sense of ourselves. Okay, but I don't want to say much more about it. Anyway, uh, how can we use the mind that comprehends emptiness on some level to visualize something? That is Tantra. I mean, how you really do this, for this you need to learn more about Tantra and, of course, receive an initiation. And I don't know. I'm 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 going. I'm not going going to go into those questions. But at the very end, your question is um, that as wholeness is giving for the third time a highest yoga tantric initiation, is it possible to attend the online session only for receiving the blessings of the Lama and for listening to the commentary without actually receiving the initiation? I don't know. I really don't know. There's so many different views on that, and I'm not the right person to answer that. Um, some would say it's okay and some would say no but i'm talking about some here i'm talking about lama so if you've got uh, a lama um a, a, like a qualified a fully qualified lama that you have a connection to and you can actually ask do that um yeah or research it i, I don't know i i have no idea honestly so I cannot advise you on that. I can only say what I heard other people have said, but they're um, opposing views. And although I've voiced my opinion in the past, but I decided I, I will no longer do that, especially because, well, it concerns highest yoga tantra. All right. And then we've got time for Edwards, Eduardo, Edwards question, more of a comment, a train of thought. Okay, if the entire Empire State Building would be reduced to the matter of its constituent atoms without the void in between them, it would have its mass condensed to a rice grain. That's so interesting. Isn't that amazing? It seems so solid. Uh, but really, the solidity aspect, that's nothing. However, nothing can go through the building without reducing it uh, or your hand because of the forces holding the atom subparticles. All right, so despite the void, there are these forces, and that's why we can't just put our hand through the wall. Uh, this creates a sensation of a physical continuum when there's none, or more of a solidity, an absence of void, when there really is an amazing absence of void. What is it, 90%, 99%? Anyway, I don't know. But similarly, when we see a movie at 24 pictures per second, we have the feeling of a continuum when there's none. There is a continuum, but we have a feeling, um, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean, like the feeling of like smooth movement when in actuality there's just all these uh, different picture frames. If you plunge into smaller scales, each step of the way from contact, feeling, perception of volition take time. No, 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 not them. Depends on how you, because they're omnipresent mental factors. So it's not like you take time from one to the next. The activity is there. The activity of the mind, that is there. But there are different degrees of it. There are different degrees. So being different degrees, okay. So they may vary in strength. And that then could happen one after the other. But actually the omnipresent mental factors. So this I wouldn't agree with. But when the, the rest, when the photon hits the retina, when the sound wave hits the eardrum, yes, absolutely. It always takes time. Processing until clearness of perception occurs takes time, totally. By the time of the realization of the event, consciously and unconsciously, it's gone. Yes, when we perceive something with our eye consciousness, our ear consciousness, what we're perceiving is no longer there. It's It was just a few seconds earlier, but still, it's no longer there. This is different from the Chittamatra school who would say it happens at simultaneously, although there's no external world, but they still say the object is there and there's a simultaneous perception. No, from the Prasangika school point of view, there's conventional external reality and that external reality is gone a moment 
uh, is, is gone when you actually, when we actually perceive it without sense consciousness. Moreover, I think that when it stops, when the object stops, its impression is still imprinted for some time. Yeah, it still lingers. The sensation, whatever, yeah, the physical brain, the physical sensations in the brain and so forth, the, the cell activity. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it may even still linger in our thoughts because there's first the sense perception and then there's a short moment of, or maybe a longer moment of reflection on it. So the brain, of course, is active at the time when our mind is reflecting on it. And that takes time. Maybe it's just the overlapping of an incoming impulse with a disappearing one that gives us an impression of continuum. And in fact, all that we perceive are discrete events. I mean, in the, like actually the discrete events on the basis of those, we label continuum. You see, a continuum still exists, um, but we need to know that this is based, that is labeled on many different moments in time. We label um, continuum. So I don't think there's, it's not like that the continuum is a, a uh, optical illusion, Con continuum itself, but the way we perceive it as a continuum, for instance, the movie and the picture frames that seem to be smooth uh, that, of course, that is an optical illusion. As for the clay, the clay in the pot is not the same clay extracted from earth. Of course not. Remember the picture, you have a lump of earth or a lump of clay versus the clay in the pot. Yeah, it's not the same clay. Um, it's not the same at any moment. No, from moment to moment it changes. Like the seed is not the same seed at any moment and the moment itself does not exist, but it's a continuum. Yes, every moment is, 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 it consists of many moments in time because you cannot find the smallest moment in time. So if you cannot find the smallest moment in time, it means you can subdivide it endlessly each moment, which means if you can subdivide each moment endlessly, at least conceptually, endlessly, and conceptually means it's, it's not you're just making it up. You can actually conceptually end, um, divide it up endlessly so that, that means that every moment however shorter it is is actually a continuum of even shorter moment yet is time continuous what is time what is time first of all we need to first determine what is time is it permanent or impermanent well if it's impermanent it's continuous it continues on but Time is merely labeled on the basis of what? On change, on impermanent phenomena around us. We label time. We label yesterday. We label tomorrow. I mean, time. Time is labeled on the basis of today, tomorrow, and so forth. And then if you take the clock, for instance, or a year and so forth, all that is part of time. And those are labeled on changes. If there weren't any changes, there wouldn't there were there was any there wouldn't be any time. So as time continues, I would say yes, but not in the intuitive sense of continuum. I can't explain why. That's quantum physics, and I don't understand it. Oh, me neither. So <laughs> I certainly won't understand it. Okay. So I wanted to read this comment. Yeah, I, I would totally agree with him. It's not really a question, and I hope it's okay with the 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 rest of the questions. Anyway, I'll I'll address them in class at least be second question so let's return to the text memory outline questions first check okay now you may notice i keep changing the text um between yesterday when I sent the text to their lead and today it's already slightly changed. Uh, but anyway, there's just slight changes. Um, here it's singular now, just it works better with these two being singular. Uh, slight changes and some typos I found. Anyway, so let's go back what we were learning about. This extremely important idea of negative phenomena and positive phenomena understanding that what we're aiming for is understanding emptiness it makes all the difference i mean how many times have we heard that 
the understanding of the lack of inherent existence is the solution to all our problems. How <laughs> we constantly look for solutions to this problem and that problem, but really the lasting solution is understanding exactly this. But first of all, besides the fact we have no idea what it really means, um, we even have a sense that something that is a mere negation can't be known. I mean, people literally say that. I think I, I mentioned this a long time ago. I've, I once listened to a BBC program, and I remember the the person who was interviewed, really smart person, uh, whatever they said was so smart. But one thing they said, I, I don't forget, he said, you can't know, you, you can't know a negative. And I was like, what? <laughs> right? I mean, even in everyday life, um, when we talk about someone being, and I forget the word again, being in recession. No, that's not recession. Um, when someone had cancer in remission, being in remission is really saying the person doesn't have cancer right now in remission, right? No cancer cells found. That is a negative and you can know that. So being in remission for me is an example of a negative that can be known. And I can know that my pen is not in this particular room. I can know that. I mean, I can also know the room, but without focusing, without the emphasis being on the room, I can know, oh, my, my, my pen is not in the room. Okay, so I definitely believe, I'm, I'm convinced that negatives can be known. But we should also know there are different types of negatives and emptiness is merely the negation of something that we have always held on to and that the, the grasping of which gives rise to all our trouble. Okay, so therefore it's important to understand the difference between the two types of negatives. So this is where we got to last time, I think. I don't remember what page we got to. 10 maybe or 9 I forget now um the two types of negatives non-affirming negatives and affirming negatives but before we got to this point I also briefly talked about the difference between negative phenomena and positive phenomena the difference being basically uh determined by conceptual consciousness on the basis of how a phenomenon appears to our mind. You remember I, I talked about this in, and, and I took it from there saying it's the conceptual mind, how an object appears to our mind. That is, so here being positive or negative, in other words, is determined by the conceptual mind, which shows us what an important role it plays, that the distinction between certain objects are all dependent on that particular mind, which plays such a huge role in our daily life. We may have a sense, of course, we have a sense, a wrong sense that phenomena exist out there. There's this reality out there. And we just happen to come across, come, come by and see things as they, or see an aspect of what's going on around us. Okay, we see we see the things that exist exactly the way they appear to us, and we just happen to perceive them. But we slowly have to undo this sense of this habitual sense of the subjective reality over there. And so it helps us to understand the working of the conceptual mind. Our reality, the reality as such, conventional reality let's not even move into the ultimate uh, sphere of how things exist just on a conventional level when we talk about conventional reality what is conventional reality it's first of all it's first of all everyone's it's the summary it's it's all everyone's it's everyone's reality added together that is what we call reality so your reality my reality and everyone else's reality so let's now look at our individual realities because my reality is not yours there are similarities but the way i spend my day may be very different from the way you spend your day and anyway i'm a different place i live in a different room i 
I'm in a different country for that matter right now and so forth. And so my reality, what is my reality there for? What is your reality for that matter? So my reality is really what is happening in my conceptual consciousness. What is happening in my thoughts? That is my reality. So even my sense perception is influenced by my thoughts. Unless I have some concept of a particular object, my sense consciousness just won't perceive it. I mean, there's scientific evidence for that. And of course, there are these stories of like, for instance, when I think it was Christopher Columbus arrived with his boats at the American shore, um, the indigenous people there couldn't see it. They couldn't see it because they had no concept of a boat, of a ship. And likewise, unless we have a concept of a tree, we won't say a tree and so forth. So what we perceive, even with our sense consciousness, is, for instance, music, right? I mean, unless you have some idea of classical music and so forth, your ear consciousness won't pick up on, on classical music. You hear some sounds, but again, you need to have a concept of sounds, etc. So this is a little complicated but in any way my reality is really what happens in my conceptual consciousness what my conceptual consciousness suggests so that is incredible because if that is my reality the only thing that I can actually influence right now is my conceptual consciousness my sense consciousness is I cannot limit what they perceive and what they don't perceive. It cannot change anyone else. That's for sure. A little bit. I can maybe make some suggestions and hope that they change. But, you know, most of the time there's not such drastic change. So I cannot change others, really. I cannot change the environment, only to a certain degree. Of course, I can do a lot, but I cannot totally change it. I cannot even change my body completely right now. And even my sense consciousnesses that are very much dependent on the body. But the one thing I can change is my conceptual consciousness. And if that creates my reality, I mean, simply based on the fact that phenomena are merely labeled, that is amazing. So I can change reality by changing my conceptual consciousness. But for that, I need to understand it better. Sorry, I'm taking it again. But I'm so fascinated by that particular topic. And it's, again, it's so liberating understanding that I can change my own. My own conceptual consciousness can change itself. I just need to learn how. But part of that is, of course, understanding how phenomena are perceived, that that, even though it's the same object, depending on how I perceive it, with the negation, for instance, negating, like I said last time, negating the friendliness of my neighbor, I have a totally different sense from my neighbor versus just thinking of neighbor. So unfriendly neighbor versus neighbor. Totally different sense. But I'm 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 getting lost here. I'm getting lost in the conceptual consciousness. So I want to go back to conceptual conceptual mind in the sense of positive and negative phenomena. All right. So let's I'll try and keep strictly to just that. Positive, negative phenomena. The difference between them, well. In the case of a positive phenomenon, a phenomenon that's the main object of a conceptual consciousness, so there's a certain conceptual consciousness taking that particular phenomenon as its main object. And so that mind then realizes the phenomenon by way of explicitly eliminate an object of negation. Okay, And if that doesn't happen explicitly, then the object is a positive phenomenon. Okay, so a negative phenomenon, when you take to mind unhappiness, what does the mind do? It explicitly negates happiness. Or emptiness, what does the mind do? It explicitly eliminates uh, empty, uh, inherent existence. Versus when you think of pen or I, that doesn't happen. I still haven't read the footnote yet. I will eventually. But let's go into negatives. So the two negatives. The negative, um, an affirming and a non-affirming negative. I took out the word uh, suggest. Suggest is not good. Indicate or imply is actually better. And I was almost, I was tempted to write emphasize. Emphasize, but maybe emphasize is a little too strong. So 
the two negatives, a non-affirming negative, if something is a negative phenomenon and the term that expresses this does not indicate or imply a positive phenomenon in place of what it negates, it is a non-affirming negative. Okay, so the eye consciousness is not physical or the lack of inherent existence of Jane. Now, what I think we ask as part of her second question, so really it's actually in the text, but I might as well say it at this point. So why, what is it about the eye consciousness? So when you take to mind the eye consciousness, or let's say this, the, the words that express eye consciousness, eye consciousness is not physical. So the words that express that phrase or that phenomenon, eye consciousness being not physical. So in the place of negating being physical, nothing is suggested, nothing is indicated, nothing is implied. So the question that a lot of people ask, it's natural to, to ask, what about the eye consciousness? Aren't you emphasizing the eye consciousness? No, you're not emphasizing the eye consciousness. It's like the emphasis is on not being physical. Not being physical. So the eye consciousness is just on the basis of which I'm focusing on it being not physical. It's different, for instance, if I, and this is what comes later on, saying the eye consciousness is not physical versus non-physical eye consciousness. Non-physical eye consciousness puts the emphasis on eye consciousness. Eye consciousness is emphasized. Saying eye consciousness is not physical, the eye consciousness is merely the basis. The main emphasis is on not being physical, right? So, well, later on it'll be explained again with emptiness, but for now, I'm not talking about emptiness so much other than just giving the example. So, eye consciousness is not physical, or the lack of inherent existence of Jane. I'm not saying non-inherently existent Jane. That's different. I'm not saying non-physical eye consciousness. Non-physical eye consciousness, that is an affirming negative because the emphasis on eye consciousness, just kind of mentioning at the side that it's not physical or non-inherently existent Jane. That's different. But lack of inherent existence of Jane. Jane is it's, it's not in the forefront. It's the lack of inherent existence based on Jane. Okay, so the emphasis is on lack of inherent existence, which is why this is a non-affirming negative. Okay, so I hope this makes it a little bit clearer, this sense of this emphasis, like when you, of course, use those words, the eye consciousness is not physical, the lack of inherent existence, but also how it appears to the conceptual mind after hearing these words and thinking about them. It appears differently to the mind, and the emphasis is different. Okay, we don't really know this so well because our mind, our mind switches from one object to the next. If I ask you, well, think about eye consciousness is not physical. For a short moment, you'll go like, okay, not physical. You'll take to mind that non-affirming negative, but then you start thinking about the eye consciousness. So the eye consciousness, when you start thinking about that. The object is a positive phenomenon, of course. So you 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 may have you it's it's like these short moments, briefly, for a short moment you think eye consciousness is not physical, then you move to eye consciousness and you think about eye consciousness even longer. And later on you think, oh, eye consciousness is not physical. I was thinking about that, but eye consciousness appeared all the time. Yeah, but when it appeared to your mind, you were not taking to mind eye consciousness is not physical. Right. I mean, when you, the emphasis was on, I'm not just appearing, but when, when, when you mainly, when the mind mainly focused on the eye consciousness, when that was your main focus, you were not taking to mind a non-affirming negative. You were taking to mind the eye consciousness, which is a positive phenomenon. Right. So it's difficult if we had concentration, if we had shamatha, for instance, and we could focus on one object for a really long time. Well, let's not even go to shamatha. Just for five minutes, we were able to stick with one object for five minutes, we'd have the experience 
uh, it'd be much clearer. I mean, we'd have the experience of staying with this object and we get a sense, oh, I've just focused on it being not physical. All right. Anyway, but that's non-affirming negatives. And then you have affirming negatives. The term expressing indicates a positive phenomenon in place of its object of negation. So that's an affirming negative, an unfriendly neighbor, the emphasis on the neighbor. So it indicates a positive phenomenon, the neighbor, in place of what the word negate, his being friendly. Okay, so it's still negated, but the emphasis on the neighbor. Now the example, out, oh, okay, so this is a little difficult, I thought, to just kind of squeeze it in there. Um, because here, the emphasis is on not permanent, but that is an, an affirming negative because the words our body is not permanent indicate a positive phenomenon, our body's impermanence, right? Because permanent and impermanent, they're direct opposites in the sense that, well, in the Buddhist sense of permanent and impermanent, of course, the Buddhist meaning of permanent and impermanent, and I'm here taking to mind the Buddhist idea of permanent. So um, my body is not permanent. What does permanent mean? Something that doesn't change. Okay. I mean, and something that exists, of course, but mainly it doesn't change. Versus impermanent, it changes. So they're direct opposites. Direct opposites. If you negate that the body is in, that the body is permanent. If you negate that, that you negate the body is not permanent, right away what is implied is that it's impermanent. So it's implied by that. So in the place of in the place of negating permanent, impermanent appears. In the place of, or in place of, in place of negating permanent, impermanent is implied. But this is different to other things. This is different to other things. Um, the opposite of unfriendly is not friendly. The opposite of unfriendly is not friendly. I mean, you can be neither friendly nor unfriendly, right? You could be just, is your neighbor really unfriendly? No. Is he really friendly? No. Like, neither. And also, a stone is neither friendly nor unfriendly. There are lots of objects that are neither unfriendly nor friendly. I mean, this is a, this is a, a characteristic that, that can be applied only to certain objects. Permanent and impermanent are different. Whatever exists is one of the two, and they are direct opposites. So when you negate one, negating permanent on the basis of body, for instance, in place of negating permanent, impermanent is implied. If you understand the difference between permanent and impermanent, of course, uh, I'm saying the meaning of permanent and impermanent in the Buddhist context. All right. Because otherwise you could say if you don't understand, you're not taking to mind permanent or impermanent. If you have no understanding of the meaning of what permanent, impermanent means, it's the same as saying emptiness. If you don't have any idea what emptiness means, just by thinking emptiness, 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 you're not taking to mind actual emptiness. Okay. All right. Anyway, we got to this. So existent, phenomena, non-affirming, affirming negatives. Those are the divisions. I hope it's clearer now. So, but there are four times, four types, or four kinds of affirming negatives. I mentioned them because, well, Lama Tsongkhapa mentioned them in his commentary, and they're always mentioned. Usually, if you have a more extensive explanation of uh, negative and positive phenomena, they are mentioned. Okay, so I'll just go through them. Um, you have affirming negatives of explicit suggestion or of explicitly indicating something or implicitly both and of context, contextual suggestion. So the terminology doesn't make that much sense right now, but hopefully the examples will. Okay, so an example of the first type of explicit suggestion. So in the place, in place of negating the object, Something is not just indicated or implied or suggested, if you want to use that term, uh, but explicitly so. Okay. For instance, the existence of the lack of inherent, oh, the existence of the lack of inherent existence of a chair. Okay. If you just read this part, the lack of inherent existence of a chair, that is a non-affirming negative. 
but it's the existence, the emphasis on the existence of emptiness, okay? Or the existence of the emptiness of the chair, the existence of the lack of inherent existence of a chair. So the emphasis on the existence and explicitly existence is, is suggested or explicitly in, um, uh, uh, it is uh, indicated. This is an affirming negative. And so the words, the existence of the lack of inherent existence of chair explicitly indicate the existence of the emptiness of a chair. Right? So they explicitly indicate that. It's explicit just from, yeah, just from hearing those words. That's what so explicitly is taken to mind or here taken to mind. I mean, anyway, the emphasis is on existence here. So at, le at least when it comes to the words, the existence of the of, of the lack of inherent existence of the chair, the words explicitly emphasize the existence in place of negating inherent existence. So the words negate, of course, saying the lack of inherent existence, you ne negate, the words negate inherent existence. Now, an affirming negative of implicit suggestion, so where it's not as obvious, is the classic example, Tfet Devadatta does not eat during the day. Um, so he's not on a diet, Devadatta survives. Uh, that is an example of an affirming negative of implicit suggestion because the phrase fat Devadatta does not eat during the day implicitly indicates that Devadatta eats at night. Okay, so Lama Tsongkhapa actually mentions since he survives. So, oh, by the way, if you're reading Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary, one thing is that sometimes the terminology used in the book is slightly different. So, for instance, and I don't know where that comes from, here, uh, Jay Garfield uses the term external and internal to refer to positive and negative phenomena. phenomena. So, external and internal. First, I didn't even know what he meant with external and internal, and then going to the Tibetan, I, and I realized, oh, he's using external and internal to refer to negative and positive phenomena. I think that's what I remember reading. So if you know that, anyway, from the context, it becomes clear because he also uses the example of Pet Devadatta. Maybe he uses the Tibetan word of Devadatta. I don't remember. Lejin. Yeah, Lejin. I think he says Lejin. Lejin is just the Tibetan word, uh, the Tibetan version of Devadatta being a Sanskrit or being a, yeah, a Sanskrit word. So anyway, Fet Devadatta does not eat during the day. So it's implied, it's implicitly suggested or implicitly indicates that Devadatta eats at night. And then you have affirming negative for both explicit and implicit suggestions. An example of this type is fat Devadatta does not eat during the day. That's the implicit part and exists as someone who is not emaciated, right? So he exists as someone who's non-emaciated. That's like saying the existence of emptiness. Existence is emphasized, but being emaciated, that so in, in place of emaciating, I'm, I'm tempted to say in the place of, but I'm not sure. Anyway, so in place of uh, negating emas being emaciated, existing is explicitly indicated. Therefore, both is done in this particular example explicitly and implicitly suggested it's not that important but it gives you a sense that there's a slight difference there's a difference by which uh, things are negated and still suggest something positive still indicate something positive a positive phenomenon affirmative phenomenon um yeah that, that there are different ways explicit or implicit. And here, this is also interesting, affirming negative of contextual suggestion, an example of the fourth type that is given in the scriptures, usually given in the scriptures, saying he's not of the Brahmin class. But in general, this is a non-affirming negative. He's not of the Brahmin class is a non-affirming non negative. But in a particular context, it is an affirming negative. So what is the context? Usually the context is given. That's why it's a contextual an uh, affirming negative. For example, if we have determined that someone like Buddha Shakyamuni is either, either of the royal class, 
caste or royal class or the Brahmin class. We have not determined which of the two classes he belongs to. The phrase he's not of the Brahmin class indicates that he's of the royal class by explicitly negating that he's of the Brahmin class. So he's not of the Brahmin class. That is an affirming negative if I know it's one of the two. And so then hearing, hearing, oh, he's not of the Brahmin class, that implies, that implies it's a contextual implication or contextual indication that Buddha Shakyamuni is of the uh, royal class. Okay, so today I'll do a little bit longer uh, before we start the meditation. I just want to finish this part. Actually, I've added a little bit more to the material, uh, and that's the first first verse. We're done with that. Yeah, so we're almost done with the first verse. And as I said, the first verses take a little longer, and later on there's much less explanation for each verse. All right, so going back to this. Uh, please note that there's a difference between negative phenomena such as the unemployed cook and the cook is unemployed. I mentioned that before, so I can just read it. For the fir former is an affirming negative, while the latter is a non-affirming negative. In the case of the unemployed cook, the emphasis is primarily on the cook. And the words the unemployed cook indicate the cook in place of negating that is employed. In the second case, the cook is unemployed. The cook is merely the basis of his situation of being out of work. And so the phrase, the cook is unemployed, does not indicate the cook or any other positive phenomenon in place of negating his being employed. The emphasis is not on the cook, the emphasis on being unemployed. So maybe it helps to distinguish between the two in that way. Okay, so now I spend a really long time uh basically feels a bit like talking to myself and so last time gila suggested to to look at all of you okay let me just do that to get back to the oh could you just take me out of the the screen sharing yeah so i can see your faces okay how do i get rid of this right there to see how confused you are. Okay, let me look at you. <laughs> you said the sense last time I was like, I, I said to Gila, I have no idea whether anyone understood anything. <laughs> so she suggested, <laughs> just look at them for a while. So yeah, was it really confusing today? No, okay, good. I, I just don't know. It's so much easier to actually see you, but I can't do both, look at you and look at the material. Okay, we're done with that, um, that part of negative and positive phenomena. I spend a lot of time on this, but if you study philosophy, it comes up all the time, time and again. And maybe you have some questions about it, but I hope it's clear that uh, there's a little bit left to go through. And then there's a little bit more about realizing emptiness. And then we can move to the second verse. As I said, we won't spend that much time on the second verse. Great. Um, and to say it again before I forget, there won't be any class next week, but then the week after. All right. So let's do some meditation. On what? Positive and negative phenomena? Hmm. Oh, let's see. I don't know. Okay. So we we'll start with some breathing meditation. As usual, giving us a chance to just let go of any disruptive thoughts. And just focus the mind on what is to come.
So now let's remember that phenomena can be divided in so many different ways. One way is to divide them into positive and negative phenomena. So, phenomenon is taken to mind by our conceptual consciousness in such a way that it's either that either something is explicitly negated or it's taken to mind without any explicit negation. An unfriendly neighbor is an example of the first. And a chair, an example of the second. That's all dependent on how an object appears how an object is perceived by our thoughts. There's some dependence on that. It's either positive or negative. That is so important, especially since emptiness is a negative. It's a non-affirming negative. Even if it's the emptiness of the I, although the I is a positive phenomenon. The emptiness of the eye is a non-affirming negative. Because the words emptiness of the eye or the conceptual mind Perceiving the emptiness of the eye.
they emphasize lack of inherent existence. They don't emphasize the I. Based on the I, its inherent existence or objective existence is merely negated. Contrast, not inherently existent I, is not emptiness. Not inherently existent I, it's an affirming negative. In other words, non-inferring, non-inherently existent I negate inherent existence. They emphasize the I. explicitly indicate the I. Now there are different types of affirming negatives. There's also an affirming negative that implicitly indicates a positive predominant. such as fat devadatta, does not eat during the day. Although none of the words suggest that it eats at any other time, Implicitly, they indicate that it eats at night. Then there is that Devadatta doesn't eat during the day. 
and exists as being non-emaciated. Which implicitly indicates he eats at night. and explicitly indicates his existence. Lastly, there's an affirming negative and textual suggestion. We're knowing, for instance, that a person is either Israeli or Indian. In that context, he's not Indian. It's an affirming negative since it contextually suggests that he's Israeli. So we're learning about and reflecting on in particular what a positive phenomenon and what the different types of affirming negatives are. Understand the difference between them and the non affirming negative. Since emptiness is such a non affirming negative. Because if we think we meditate on emptiness, I take to mind an object that suggests anything affirmative, and it's not emptiness. So now let's conclude this short reflection. Focusing on whatever insight we've gained. Focusing on it single-pointedly for a few moments. 
be able to internalize that inside. And let's dedicate all the positive potential we accumulated together here today. Of course, dedicating it towards our future enlightenment. May this be one of the many causes we need to accumulate to attain the fully enlightened state of a Buddha. In order to be of greatest benefit to all sentient beings. And may our virtue, our positive potential also be a cause for our great masters, like as home as the Dalai Lama. Mike Kipchir Jadaram will soon visit Israel and so forth. To have an extremely long life. be strong and healthy to continue to inspire and guide us. And lastly, let's also dedicate all the positive potential, especially towards those who are dealing with the death of a loved one dealing with the loss of someone close to them. May they be able to quickly overcome their pain and their grief and once again find joy in life. And of course, may our virtue continue to help Geshe Punso, Hali Lubin, and everyone else who is sick to quickly overcome their physical and mental ailments. Without letting go of the start of dedication, let's recite the prayers. Through the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chinresik, Denzin Yatsu, please remain until samsara ends. May the precious Bodhi mind, not yet born, arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. All right, thank you very much. So please remember the law of karma for this coming week. But of course, also what you learned about emptiness, about the lack of inherent existence, and bodhicitta. So to bring those together, and you've got two weeks to meditate on that. Uh, also, well, for karma, if you continue, if you can continue, of course, also with the characteristics, the four characteristics of karma, as I described in the lamrim, or just continue with any lamrim meditation in relation to karma, uh, that would be great for the meantime. Okay. So then have 
wonderful two weeks. Uh, enjoy his homeless teachings. Of course he will, but yeah, just to say it again. And see you in two weeks then. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Laila Tov. Laila Tov. Thank you.